Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement here at JTS. I'm so happy to welcome you to today's session of our spring series, which we've called Timely Insights, Timeless Wisdom, um, Collected Gems from JTS Scholars. Special welcome if anyone is joining us for the first time today. Um, we are so pleased to have um, Dr. Ravi Harris, who is Professor of Bible and Ancient Semitic Languages at JTS, teaching us today. He has been at JTS for a long time and has taught in uh, such a wide array of community learning programs, but somehow or other has never been part of this particular Monday series. So we're really pleased to welcome him for the first time. And his session today is called How the Rabbinic Adoption of Roman Party Conventions Came to be Known as Our Passover Seder. Um, we are moving into a, um, a a section of our spring series that's kind of oriented towards upcoming holidays. So obviously Passover is coming and today's session is geared towards that. Um, we're going to be on hiatus for two weeks for Passover. And uh, when we come back, we'll have a session for Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and um, another commemorating Yom HaZikaron, um, Israel's Memorial Day. Um, and then I did also want to announce one schedule change. Um, we have added a really wonderful session to our series with a guest scholar, um, Dr. Elias Sachs from the Jewish Publication Society. He's going to be joining us on May 20th to introduce JPS's um, new new uh, Bible translation. It's really wonderful. And um, when I when I was introduced to it by him, I said, we have to bring this to our Monday learners. So we're adding that session on May 20th. And what was going to be the final session with Dr. Ben Summer will be after that on um, June 3rd, and that will be a pre-Shavuot session. Um, uh, when when people come to the uh, the Seder, we all gather around the table and uh, we, um, you know, we open up the sacred or the holy Maxwell House Agata or whatever else we have. And we we set about observing the, the rituals. And we don't think about the choices. We don't often think about the choices that were made in antiquity that led to that service, right? Uh, put differently, uh, uh, Jews or ancient Israelites didn't always have a Seder. They celebrated Passover in a different way. And what we're going to do today is look at some of the sources that indicate the, the, the development as well as the process through which we ended up with our Seder. Um, but uh, I like to say what we have to do is not start with the, the you know, the sacred and canonized Maxwell House Sagata, however much we feel uh, strongly about that, but to go back to a different book, um, we call that the Torah. Uh, we call that the book of Exodus in particular. And I am going to start our screen share. If I do it right, let's see. I think I did it right. So <clears throat> what we see here in Exodus chapter 12 is the core text in the Torah uh, that it concerns itself with what you and I would call Leila Seder, the, the first evening of Passover. And <clears throat> um, you should be able to see both a Hebrew and English text in front of you, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, I, Julie, I do see your picture on my screen. So uh, you're confirming that they can see two columns there. Excellent. Okay, so I want us to take a look at this excerpt first from Exodus chapter 12. And the scene, of course, is... The Israelites are still in Egypt at this point. The um, 10th plague has not taken place. The splitting of the sea has not yet taken place. This is pretty early. So speak to the whole community of Israel. Say that on the 10th of the month, right, each of them shall take a lamb. You can also take a goat if you want to. Keep watch over it until the 14th day. And all of the assembled congregation of the Israelites shall slaughter it at twilight, right? They'll take some of the blood. You know the story. They put it on the lintel of the house. And then when God's destructive power is released over Egypt, that will end up being what we call the 10th plague, that um, uh, the blood of that, of that um, slaughtered beast will serve as a kind of a force field 
to not allow God's destructive power to come inside the house, right? Now, our job today is not to say, that's like weird, or how did it work? We're just going to accept it on, on faith right now that that was the ritual, right? Now, I will also say that some of us, particularly if you went to a yeshiva or a traditional Jewish education, might call this Korban Pesach, the Passover sacrifice. But what you're seeing here in Exodus 12, trust me, is not a sacrifice. Um, uh, uh, sacrifices in uh, biblical era in ancient Israel had certain requirements, which we'll get to in about five minutes. But this is a ritual. It's not a sacrifice. There's no sacred space. Where does this take place? It takes place in your backyard. There's no um, priesthood. There's no Kohen. It's just whoever the head of the household. And uh, more in particular, how is it served? It is wholly roasted. That's W-H-O-L-L-Y. Uh, and as we'll come to see, um, uh, meat that is uh, uh, slaughtered for uh, sacred purposes as a sacrifice to the temple is always boiled. And in fact, so stringent and, and directed is the requirement that this not be boiled. It says it a couple times, and I think I have at least one. It says, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you're not allowed to boil it. That says it somewhere in there in that handout. Um, now, already built into the structure of this ancient ritual is a question and an answer. And that will lead us to our main purpose today. It says, when you enter the land that the Lord will give you, you shall observe this rite. This right, meaning slaughter the Passover, daub it on the doorpost and all that. And when your children ask you, what do you mean by this right? You shall say, it's the Passover sacrifice. Now it says here, Passover sacrifice, because I took the English translation from uh, a text that you all know. But if you are able to look at the Hebrew, it doesn't say that. It says, I have a little less control over this than I wanted, but um, it says... In verse 27, Zevach Pesach. It should read, this is the Passover slaughtering, right? Not this is the Passover sacrifice. That, that is a mistranslation. Okay, so this slaughtering is to be taking place in your home and it's commemorating what will be about to be, you know, this 10th tenth, this tenth plague, okay? Now, you might ask yourself, and I want you to ask yourself, you might ask yourself, what happened to this ritual? It's very, very clear in the Torah that you're supposed to do this forever, right? Or certainly when you get into the land. Um, uh, what happened to this ritual and why, do not, uh, why don't we do this anymore? There's not a clear answer to that question, but we're going to get to it. Um, okay, the next text I want you to consider is a text from Deuteronomy 16. Now, this is not a text that people have in their in their kishkas, you know, in their in their soul. It's not one that we um, uh, uh, reference in the Passover Seder that we have that's come down to us. But this is a key. Um, you might want to call it an amendment or a reflecting of a different ancient Israelite tradition. Uh, the whys and the wherefores are not our purpose today, but this is. It comes from a, probably a different group of ancient Israelites, different group of Kohanim. It might be a Northern text as opposed to a Jerusalem text. But for our purposes today, look at the description of Passover that this Torah text contains. Observe the new moon of Aviv, Kodesh Aviv. Offer, here it says, a Sita Pesach. Now again, it says offer a Passover sacrifice. It doesn't actually say that in the Torah. It says Offer the Pesach, okay, without without qualification, to the Lord your God. For it was in the new moon of Aviv at night that the Lord your God freed you from Egypt. Now, pause for a moment. If we were to scroll back here, I, I wonder if I have the whole text. But if you were to open up Exodus 12, you have at home, right? Um, but here you have at the very least what day does it take place? The 14th day, right? The 14th day. In the Deuteronomy text, it says the new moon, which means it's on the first of the month. So Deuteronomy, right from the get-go, has a different perspective about the when, the where, the by whom, and the how. 
every aspect of the Passover ritual that Exodus described is contradicted by the book of Deuteronomy. Let's take a brief look. So it happens on the new moon. You shall slaughter the Passover sacrifice of the Lord your God from the flock and from the herd, right? Tzon uvakar, it says in Hebrew. Now, in, in the Exodus text, it says only tzon. It says a small cattle, meaning a goat or a lamb, whereas in, <clears throat> um, uh, in Exodus, it also permits a cow. Right now, if you studied with me, with me in another one session uh, uh, last year, you might remember a session called <clears throat> "The Cow That Laid an Egg," which is, <clears throat> if God gives me the strength, it'll be the title of a book I'm writing about the Passover uh, rituals. But um, the cow that laid an egg is 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 mentioned right here. That's the cow because the herd refers to um, a different a different sacrifice. And where should it take place? In the place where the Lord will choose to establish his name, meaning in the temple. So as opposed to Exodus, which locates this ritual in your backyard, right? It is going to be something that happens only in the temple. And finally, in verse seven, how shall you prepare it? Ta-da, you shall boil it. <clears throat> and that's something we don't often think about, but all of virtually all of the past, of the, um, uh, the sacrifices that were done in the temple were slaughtered, and then the meat was boiled. And again, if this was a different class, if this were a different class, we would look elsewhere in the Bible and see that all of the references to sacrifices in the temple, in the rest of the Bible, are all referring to boiled meat. So there you have it. Instead of roast lamb, which I can see mouths watering already, you're going to have boiled flunken for, uh, for your Passover dinner. And by the way, um, the rabbis were much concerned with the contradictions between these two texts, and it is the resolution of those contradictions that lead to much of our ritual today, and we'll get to that a little bit later too. But the main point, your takeaway, is that it is Deuteronomy 16 that really talks about a Passover sacrifice, whereas Exodus chapter 12 is talking about a home ritual. Okay, so that that's your takeaway number one. Okay, now I don't have to tell you where, where's the next one. Ah, I don't have to tell you that in antiquity we commemorate still to this very day from antiquity the dates that the temple was destroyed. All right, we have Tisha B'Av and observance both traditionally for the first and for the second temple. And what we were taught in our um you know, our Hebrew schools or our education is that after the destruction of the temple, there are no more sacrifices. Now, this is not something that is obvious, right? Because as you see, just from these two texts, a legitimate possibility might have been, okay, the temple has been destroyed, no more Deuteronomy 16, let's go back, let's revert to the earlier practice of Exodus 12. Because it doesn't, if you read this text on its own, and I encourage you to do this, it's not one of those things, don't try this at home. I actually want you to try this at home. If you read this text, there's nothing about the abrogation of this ritual in Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12 presumes that it is a forever ritual, okay? Not dependent on anything else, priesthood, temple, or anything else. So we have to ask ourselves kind of a hard question a hardcore question and keep it forefront. Why did we not do this, right? Now, I will tell you that after this destruction of the second temple, there is some evidence, some evidence that Israelites, Judeans, right, Jews, ended up uh, offering the sacrifice again. And they did so for some couple of hundred years until the practice was eventually stamped out. Um, there are indications in, in the literature, both in um, uh, Talmudic rabbinic literature, as well as outside of that, that Jews went okay. Now, you might have a little vestige of this in your own home. If you are uh, uh, a family that comes from Ashkenazic Jewish background, the traditional way of understanding that is you have more direct ties to the land of Israel in antiquity. And in the land of Israel, um, they uh, they forbid this this uh, practice. They didn't want you to do this um, uh, because they didn't want you to think of it as a sacrifice because there should not be a sacrifice outside of the temple. 
right? Even after the temple was destroyed. That's what the sages of antiquity held. But in uh, Babylonia, they, nobody who shechted, who slaughtered a, a goat or a lamb on the eve of Passover would say, well, it's not a sacrifice. We're in Babylonia. We're not in the land of Israel. Nobody worried about that. So the tradition of the Babylonian community, which later very much influenced what we call the Sephardic community, they said, they said, Gegez in their head, although they didn't say it in Yiddish, go have lamb. Nobody was concerned that it might be a sacrifice. And in fact, since I am a product of an intermarriage, I contribute intermarriage, that is to say, my wife is Moroccan. Uh, her family always had lamb on Friday, on uh, the, the eve of Passover, whereas my grandparents always brisket. You never had, never had lamb on, on the Seder. So there, there were vestiges of this that continued for some time, but obviously the dominant tradition is to have what you and I call a Seder. Where did it come from? And that's why I'll turn to a, a, a non-rabbinic text. This is actually a, from a modern article about a Greco-Roman institution called the symposium, right? From the Greek word that means to drink together. And last time I checked, most of our satyrs had at least four glasses of wine. So our drinking together in fellowship is itself a symposium. And there are some other qualifications to that, which uh, are, are, are key to understanding our Seder. So the Greek symposium was a key Hellenic social institution. That is to say, ancient Greece and Rome. It was a forum for the progeny of respected families to debate, to plot, to boast, or simply to revel with each other. Now, I'm underlining that word revel because we're going to come back to that later. To revel with each other. They were frequently held to celebrate the introduction of youth into aristocratic society. Symposia were also held by aristocrats to celebrate other special occasions, such as victories in athletic or poetic contexts. It is worth noting, however, that many archaic poetic sources were written by members of the social elite communities and so may not be completely representative of the whole local society. So I'm going to pause there because I'm going to stop sharing for just a second. When, when we talk about a Greco-Roman uh, social or cultural institution that may be underlying our rabbinic Seder, like you might say, what? How could it be, right? We're not supposed to follow Greco-Roman customs. We're supposed to follow Jewish customs. Don't you remember the story of Hanukkah, right? Of course you do. And you know the Greeks are the bad guys in that story and the, you know, the Maccabees are the good guys. And you might think that the subsequent development of ancient Jewish history was a rejection of Greek customs and the favoring of solely ancient Israelite customs. If you thought that, you would be mistaken. And it was our own, uh, the great scholars at JTS uh, uh, of previous generations, people like Saul Lieberman of Blessed Memory, that, that demonstrated that, au contraire, you have, in fact, a whole-scale adoption of this symposium form by the rabbis when they completely redid the idea of what it meant to celebrate Passover, especially after the temple was destroyed, uh, uh, in, in an ongoing way in the rabbinic-led community. Now, this didn't happen overnight, right? This did not happen overnight. And again, were we to do a different uh, course or session, we might look at such texts as um, uh, the New Testament description of the Last Supper, right? Um, uh, or one of the last meals of Jesus. Um, the idea that they had as a, as a a beginning of a Christian element, a built-in sacrifice with Jesus taking the place of the lamb, that's the Gospel of John in particular, that you would be, you would, you might wonder, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not saying that we would do that, but we could have done something like that. Why didn't we have this alternative? And what I'm trying to suggest to us here is that there was a choice made a deliberate choice to not go in that re-dedication uh, of a sacrificial meal, but to go in a completely different, dire a different direction. And there are rabbinic texts that indicate that, that phrase. I'm just going to reference one of them. After we make Kiddush on Friday night, you remember the five rabbis that gather in B'nai Brak. And what did those rabbis um, talk about all night? 
they talk about Yitziat Mitzrayim. They debate the contours of the Exodus. They tell the story. That's the story of the Exodus. What we have is a um, in a, a parallel rabbinic text that there wasn't a lot of, there were not a lot of legs to, right? Uh, not a lot of um, continuation, but from an earlier generation, we have a different group of rabbis meeting in a different town. Here it's Lod, near the airport. Of course, there wasn't an airport back then, um, but th those, those rabbis met in Lod. And what did they talk about? They talked about the Pesach, right? They talked about the very fine points about the sacrifice or the observance that the Bible itself commanded. Those rabbis did not have much of a continuation in, in the later rabbinic discourse. It was the rabbis of B'nai Brak right after the destruction of the temple, one generation later, and they set our path directly from, um, from their uh, uh, outlining of what the observance would be, and it goes from there straight to the, you know, the Maxwell House Haggadah. Right. So and the, the, the means through which they did that was this idea of a symposium. And if you think about our Seder, where we get around table fellowship, we drink a lot of wine, we sing songs, we tell stories, and most particularly, we ask and answer questions, posed questions, to be sure, the four questions, you remember, the, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that whole idea was a rabbinic adaptation or adoption of a Greco-Roman social pattern with certain key differences that, again, if, uh, if I manage our time correctly, we'll be able to look at later today, okay? So I'm just going to pause for a moment. Um, I, I don't remember, uh, is it Ellie is getting the questions or you, Tani? Are there burning questions about these uh, biblical texts that have already um, been transmitted to you? Uh, I'm taking the questions. Thank you. I wasn't sure who was doing the questioning. I apologize. All good. Um, so, yeah, we, we had a couple of questions I think are worth asking. Now, one person um, asked about the Samaritans uh, continuing the original sacrificial practice. Right. It is not necessarily the original, but an adaptation. It's a kind of Samaritan ad adaptation of the Deuteronomic passage. The Samaritans are a group. If you look, the key text, um, Julia, is 2 Kings 17. So you can put that in the chat if you want to. 2 Kings 17, which tells the story of the so-called 10 lost tribes in the, um, the 8th century BCE. The Samaritans um, understand their community as a direct offshoot of those Israelites who stayed in the land after the destruction of the Northern Kingdom. So again, 2 Kings 17, not a text that you may have studied in Hebrew school, but really, really important. So the Samaritans um, uh, had a temple, and they had a temple in Shomron, right, up in the north of Israel. And uh, it was destroyed in late antiquity, I think by one of the Maccabees. So they didn't have their temple anymore, so they couldn't do the whole series of sacrifices. So they adapted the idea of a continuation of the sacrifice a la Exodus chapter 12, but keeping in, 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 uh, um, in mind the idea of a temple sacrifice from Deuteronomy 16. And they continued to do it. I actually went to it one year in 1977 when it was still kind of you know, safe to just take a bus from Jerusalem up to Shrem. And um, I uh, I met with them. I sat, they set up a bleachers and it was kind of cool. I mean, they killed a lot of lambs that night, but, um, and I didn't get to eat it because I'm not a member of the community, but uh, definitely uh, they still, they went that way. But again, there's not too many Samaritans left, a few thousand. Right. Thank you. I guess uh, sure. not an event for vegetarians. Um so one by the more... way, I, I, for those who are vegetarians, Julia, I, I, I will say that I had a roommate, uh, a vegetarian roommate for years, and um, he always put a baked potato, a big sweet potato, so he could have, wait for it, a Paschal yam. Good, right? <laughs> Good so one. Vegetarians out there, you have your Paschal yam. Anyway, go ahead for your second question, Julia. Um. A couple of people asked different versions of this question. So also it's it's sort of fundamental. So I thought it was worth asking now. And that's, um, you know, the different types of references to what we have um, or what, what we uh, 
read from the text as being all one holiday, but maybe was not originally. We have Chag HaAviv, the holiday of spring, Chag HaPesach, the Paschal offering, Chag HaMatzot. So if I if I go that. down that rabbit hole very deeply, we won't we won't um we won't just go, go shallow. <laughs> but I, I will take one one toe in the water. Um, there are two biblical festivals that are mentioned, although each of them has a variety of names. But for our purposes, Chag Pesach is a one day festival, which you saw takes place on the fourteenth of the the month, or in Deuteronomy on the first of the month. And then it is immediately followed with a contiguous Chag HaMatzot, or a grain festival um, uh, of seven days duration. Um, at some point before the Bible was finished being redacted, those two were combined into one festival. But if you remember Rogers and Hammerstein's um, Oklahoma, you can understand or think back to Cain and Abel that these each of these uh, festivals re refer back to a farmer's basic uh, festival and a, 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 a herdsman. So, oh, the farmer and the cowman should be friends. I just wanted to sing that a little bit. Um, uh, a, um, a, a, a song from Oklahoma that those two festivals, one of the herd and one of the, the farmer were combined pretty early on. Great, okay. thank you. Okay. I will hold the rest of the questions for uh, okay, so the next We're moving round. on? Yeah. We're moving on. All right, so I'm going back to my screen share. Let's see if I do this right. I hope so. Okay. So we already move at this point to the four questions. Now, um, I'm going to do a little bit of close textual analysis because I'll tell you, uh, uh, I always say to people uh, that I'm helping to guide satyrs, I don't permit the four questions to be asked at my satyr unless somebody is around to find where they are answered in the traditional Haggadah. And it doesn't work if you have, you know, a, a modern uh, Haggadah that has answers printed in. But the short story is these four questions are never answered in the Haggadah because they are not the original questions. Um, and I want us to see that both on, I know they're so familiar, they look like Avi, these are the four questions, right? Um, so here's the short story. What are the four questions? The first question asks about Chametz versus Matzah, correct? We all there? Well, we, you can see that text, Chametz and Matzah. The second one says, on, we eat vegetables. It says, Ein achalif sha'ar We eat all kinds of vegetables. Halayla zem maror. Okay? So the second question is about maror. And how do you translate maror, everyone? You'll all say it. Bitter herbs, right? Shortly, we'll see that it doesn't actually mean that. But hold on. Third question. We don't even dip vegetables once. On this night, we dip twice. Right? So that is a curious question. Because the, we know the original form of the question was, on all other nights, we dip once. Tonight, we dip twice. And this goes to the, the heart of the symposium. The symposium, as you'll recall from the definition uh, on, your, on your handout, is a sacred meal with questions, answers, texts, drinking, and all sorts of things. And it also began, began, like most of your special meals that you still have today, it begins with the Yiddish concept of hors derbies, right? Um, you're not going to invite lots of people over for a dinner party without hors d'oeuvres. And um, what do you see the hors d'oeuvres are? You know, they're little cheese and crackers, or little pieces of, you know, et cetera. You know, maybe it's sushi. We all, by the way, you notice that in, in Jewish ceremonies today and celebrations, you must have sushi. A generation ago, my, my, my parents' generation, it was chopped liver molds. You, you couldn't have a, a simcha without a chopped liver mold that was shaped into something. Now it's sushi. But back to our story. Here you have the original questions that all nights that we would have such a gathering, we dip. And the first dipping is something usually in salt water. And why do we do that? We do that to whet the appetite. That's the idea of any appetizer. Right. So this question is really about the second dipping. Right. The original question is about why do we dip this second time? And what is, I ask you, the second dipping? Right. If it were a sixty four thousand dollar question, I would ask you to put the, the answer in the chat. You would probably inundate poor Rabbi Andelman. But you could think about writing it down because it's not as obvious as they think. 
The second dipping is maror in charoset, right? And that doesn't happen till just before the meal actually begins. We dip the maror in the charoset. So now you're stuck with a dilemma here, because now that you understand that the, the third question is about maror, and the second question is about maror, you might ask, why do we need two questions about the same ritual? And the short story is, we don't. Each of these questions comes from a different tradition, which we'll see in just a minute. So the idea of asking a question about the maror or the mirarin is an important part of it, but it does not originally need to get asked twice. Okay? Um, I'll say one other thing before I move on. This second question about maror is not found in any ancient Passover tradition, not rabbinic, not whatever. And the first time we see it is in what's called the Kaufman manuscript of the Mishnah. Where, oh, excuse me, it doesn't even appear there. I apologize. It doesn't happen until later on. It's not an a, a, a original question. It's part of a certain tradition. So before I asked you, what does the word maror mean? And I know you all said bitter herbs, but here the idea about dipping doesn't mention their bitterness. Do it, right? It has nothing to do with an understanding. In fact, it's rooted in a text, um, one found in um, uh, Exodus 12 and one found in the so-called second uh, generation um, uh, Passover in the book of Numbers. But it says the commandment about eating the Passover lamb, it says, matzot al mirorin yochluhu. You shall eat it, the Passover a lamb or goat, together with, that's what al means, together with matzah and mirarin. And mirarin here means nothing more, nothing less than a kind of a relish. Was it bitter? It may have been bitter. But mirarin in, in and of itself is just the relish that you eat together with the matzah and the maro, uh, the matzah and the pesach. And that's what Hillel, uh, the so-called Hillel sandwich commemorates later in the Seder. So it should be a little bit suspicious to you that here and here we have essentially the same question. Now, this last one about reclining, that was the one I wanted to say, doesn't exist in any ancient version of the Seder. In fact, the first time we see it is not till the Gaonic period, while there, you know, Islam was already the, the, the world religion, you know, in, as it came to be in the Middle East. Um, uh, because nobody in antiquity would have needed to ask why we reclined at a sacred meal like this. You may remember the, the movie Ben-Hur. Love Ben, hated her. Um, sorry. Um, the, uh, the, the, you know, somebody just grimace a little bit for these questions, these jokes. Um, uh, Charlton Heston, right at the beginning of the, the movie, you know, he's lying down. They bring him a tray and he makes mozi, right? In English. Um, but he's he's like reclining, like everybody in ancient Greco-Roman antiquity would recline. You didn't sit at a table. You sat propped up by pillows and they brought low tables, triclinia, they were called because they had three legs on them. And the special dishes of the meal, they would be there. So um, uh, that gives you an idea for your Seder uh, to do it in the living room and on the floor with pillows instead of the dining room table. You can thank me or rather the Mishnah for that. But at any rate, so now we have a question that doesn't exist in, in antiquity about reclining, which was added later. And we have these two questions, which really ask the same thing. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit stuck. Why do we have this text about the four questions? We go to our next text. Now, almost every Passover ritual that we have in our Seder comes down to two paragraphs of the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah is the codification of rabbinic legal practices. Its uh, traditional date of publication is early in the third century CE. So hundreds and hundreds of years after the Bible is, is finished. And it takes place around the publication of this around the same time they, uh, the Romans uh, jurists uh, started to, to um, canonize, if you will, or publish the Digest, a, a collection of ancient Roman legal customs. So the Mishnah is the Judean concomitant to that Roman practice. 
And in its section of Psachim, right, the Pesachs, plural, in chapter 10. Everything that comes before the first nine chapters of the Mishnah really has to do with practices regarding chametz and the disposal of chametz or the sacrifice that was not practiced anymore. But almost all of our rituals come down to Mishnah Psachim chapter 10. So pause for a minute. If you are interested in that, I highly recommend a book by the late lamented Baruch Boxer, B-O-K-S-E-R, called The Origin of the Seder. And in other contexts, I teach that book. But the, the, basically, that book is ancient rabbinic understanding of the Seder from this chapter of the Mishnah and concomitant uh, parts of other rabbinic literature. Uh, you can download the whole book for free uh, just by asking Rabbi Google. Um, uh, Baruch Boxer, B-O-K-S-E-R, The Origin of the Seder, highly recommended. So the, the two paragraphs that we'll now concern ourselves with as the core of our Seder are Mishnah 4, and we'll see in a minute Mishnah 5. So what is Mishnah 4 all about? They mix for in the second cup. So the first cup is Kiddush, right? You know that, you say Kiddush right away at the, at the Shabbos table, at any festival, also at the, at the Seder. The second cup, they mix for it, which we would say they pour, because in antiquity, you had very, very strong, almost whiskey strength wine that was mixed with water. Um, so they mix the second cup and here the son asks his father. We would say the child asks the parent or the Seder leader. And if there is no understanding of the child, his father teaches them. Okay, so meaning that a, a, a child who doesn't have the capacity to ask the question still has to be taught. And what's the question? Here's one that you all remember. I'm sorry that it's not coming out cleanly in blue but it, you should see somewhat. They all know that. That's the introduction to the four questions. And here you have in the Mishnah, one, two, three, four questions, four answers, four variations of the question, right? One of them is in brackets because as I said, it don't exist in antiquity. So on all of the nights we eat chametz and matzah, this night only matzah. That, we know that question. On all other nights, we dip one time. On this night, two times. So what's listed here as question four is a, a question that we know in some variation as question three. We have it, we don't even dip once because in Babylonia, they already didn't follow the Greco-Roman practices of having uh, hors d'oeuvres. So they didn't know about the first um, dipping in salt water to be very, very common. So it was special for them. That's how that question got changed. But now we have a question that none of us ask. On all other night, we eat meat that is roasted, stewed, or boiled. On this night, only roasted. Now, what text did we study earlier today that reflects that version of the Passover ritual? Send your questions in the form of a question to Rabbi Julia. Now, um, uh, this, this goes back to Exodus chapter 12, of course. Right, the idea that you could not have any kind of meat that you wanted, like like boiled flanken or some other uh, stew meat, you only would have a, a, a lamb or a goat wholly roasted over an open fire. Lambs are roasting over an open fire. Sorry, um, Exodus chapter twelve. So this text, which we call from this anonymous mission, there's no rabbi mentioned here. No rabbi's name is mentioned. This question is not a question any of us ask anymore, but you see in the early third century, that was the, one of the traditional questions because it's still reflecting a text which itself reflects a tradition where people expected to have a roasted lamb or goat on the, on, on, uh, the eve of Passover. And this question about this maror is in brackets. Again, I put it there so it doesn't exist. What question do we not see at all? We don't see about the reclining because I told you it didn't exist in antiquity. So how many questions existed in antiquity according to this Mishnah? What's the special number? Not four questions, but three. So originally you have three questions, not four. Now there's another version of this and it's coming up right now in Mishnah 5, Rabban Gamliel. Now, Rabban Gamliel 
is a known rabbi. This is probably Rabbi Gamaliel II. He comes after the Bar Kokhba rebellion and or somewhere around then. And his he was the president of whatever the Sanhedrin was. He was a very important rabbi. And he says, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I've got a new Passover tradition. And let's look very carefully at what he says. Without being overly pedantic, I'm going to read it to you. Rabban Gamliel would say, anyone who does not say three words on Pesach has not fulfilled his duty. And what are these? Pesach, Matzah, and Marar. Okay, pause for a minute. Does this say anything about eating those three things? Come on, fess up. It doesn't, does it? It just says, kol shalo amar. You must ritually say these words. And what are the three words? Pesach, matzah, and maror. Right here. You got to say them. Does it say point to them? Does it say lift them? Does it say explain them? No, it don't. Not right away. It says just, he says you got to say it. And the reason is Rabbi Gamliel living after the destruction of the temple, after the Barakach rebellion, it was really, you know the old expression, yid, it's difficult to be a Jew. It was difficult to be a Jew after the Barakach rebellion in Judea in particular, because the Romans were, were hell-bent on exterminating the whole rabbinic class that had led to that, that third, uh, third Jewish uprising against Rome. And trying to exportate Jews, Judaism as they did, they made it very, very hard for Jews. And Rabbi Gamli was therefore concerned with a community that was so destitute, so desperate, that they might not have the wherewithal to go to the, you know, the butcher and get the shank bone and get all the stuff and the box of matzah. They might not have been enough to eat. How do they observe the Passover? He says, you can just say the words. You don't have to eat it, right? And this is an innovation that we call prayer, right? This is where the generation where prayer begins to substitute for the ancient temple ritual. We have another prayer that comes from the same circle, and that's called Musaf, a cow's favorite prayer. The, um, what do we, we don't sacrifice in our, in our synagogues, but we have a special additional Amida that we recite that we call Musaf, the addition, in which we recount the sacrifices. And it's the same ethos that Rabbi Gamaliel is saying. You don't have the wherewithal. The temple's destroyed. You shouldn't, shouldn't go out to sacrifice. Just say the verses. Say the verses, that's enough. Prayer takes the place of the ancient ritual. So here Rabbi Gamaliel is saying the same thing about our Seder. But let's look at his three things. Pesach, Matzah, and Marar. And go back up here, we have those same three questions. Matzah, Basar Tzali, right? Pesach, and the dipping. And as we already said, the dipping, yeah, I'm trying to highlight it for you, can't. The dipping has to be with regard to the second dipping, eating the marar. So Rabban Gamliel, his text is the only thing in the traditional Passover Seder that comes close to answering the original three questions, right? And it, it, it forms a frame. Right after Kiddush, you say the four questions, and right before the meal, you mention Rabbi Gamliel. And this is, again, the Max Laos Haggadah or any traditional Haggadah. It forms a frame. Everything else in the Seder before the meal comes in between those two bookmarks. And each of them the, mish, the, the four questions that we have kind of reflects Mishnah 4 and Rabban Gamli, of course, Mishnah 5. So again, Mishnah 4 and Mishnah 5 preserve the original questions, the original three questions. Now pause for a minute and then we'll pause for questions. You might ask, well, why the movement from three to four? And that is motivated in the main by once Christianity which is claimed, don't forget, via the New Testament and the traditions about Jesus, it's claimed Passover for its own central ritual that they end up calling the Eucharist. Once they've claimed Passover, and by the third century or early in the fourth century, the idea of a trinity 
uh, or at least the duality leading to a trinity was accepted as the concomitant of that observance, the rabbis are extremely discomforted by any of the threes at the Passover Seder. So they basically and systematically go through all of the ancient rituals that mention the number three and change them to four. It is in this very period where the three sons become the four sons. The sacred three cups of wine become the four cups of wine. And the only three that stays in our Seder, which is the so-called three matzot at the beginning, that was not a tradition until about the 14th century. It's a very recent tradition. Uh, every other authorized um, commandment or description of the Passover matzot has only two, like you would have at any Shabbat or Yantif. You have two loaves. Um, and if you need the proof text, you go to Exodus chapter 16, the story of the manna and the description of how the two loaves because two portions of manna fell on Friday so that the Israelites would not have to gather it on Shabbat, they had the two loaves of manna that becomes, by representative uh, follow-up, the two chalot, or on Passover, the two matzot. So the fact that we have three matzot at the beginning, again, I've written about that for the seminary, that is a much later tradition. But in terms of the ancient traditions, all the threes get changed to four. Now we'll come back and talk about the question and answer, but I've been told to, to pause for questions that you may have had in the last 20 minutes or so. So Julia. Yes, thank you. Um, there was a question about going back a little bit, but um, you were saying that Murorim does not uh, refer to bitter herbs, but to um, to vegetables and hors d'oeuvres more broadly, and there was some surprise, and how do we know that? Uh, well, we know that um, uh, if I may, I'll, I'll just quickly share again to show you. It's in the text that, um, it's in text five, um, because once the, um, once you go to Rabban Gamil, he does a, a midrash on the word maror, and he said, um, let's see, each and every Maror, since the Egyptians embittered, right? The Mirorim in the book of, uh, in both in Exodus 12 and in Numbers 9, um, uh, don't have the same root. But in, in, in when uh, Rabban Gamaliel is look, he hears the word Maror or Mirorim, and he connects it with the Hebrew root mem resh resh, a geminate root where the, the R is doubled. And that means to embitter. So he's going, don't just think of the maror as relish. Think of it as a symbol that indicates the embitterment with which the you know Egyptians embittered our lives. So Rabban Gamaliel is the one who introduces the idea of bitter herbs, bitter experience and slavery, but it does, it's not built into the word mirrorin in the, in the Torah. Mm -hmm. now, put differently, you can go look at the whole Torah narrative in the whole book of Exodus and beyond. And there's no verse that talks about the Egyptians embittering our lives and connecting it to the eating or the consumption of maror together with the, the Corban Pesach. Right, right. It's interesting. Um, so, so do you think when it says to eat the korban pesach with with matzah and maror, um, but like matzah has all this symbolic significance the way the, the way the the sacrifice does, um, but apparently well, maror not, doesn't. Maybe, maybe or, not, or is that sort of imported from? Is that is that is that symbolic significance sort of imported from another tradition? So it's 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 interesting, Julia. I, I sometimes talk about. It. Imagine this happened to me once. Don't ask me why. All right, I'll tell you why. Um, uh, we went to an opening day years ago, uh, uh, Nellie and the girls and I, and it was one of those you know early April baseball games, and we were frozen. It was so cold, and they wouldn't let us into the stadium right away. And if you know a uh, Yankee Stadium, there's a McDonald's right by the um, the uh, exit of the subway there. So Nellie says, let's go in and get tea. 
you know, uh, and uh, I think one girl wanted, you know, uh, an apple pie or something. So anyway, there everybody is crowded in the McDonald's getting hamburgers and everything. And I get up and I said, yes, uh, uh, three teas and then, you know, an apple pie and uh, one salad packet, please. And the woman is writing it down. She goes, but how many hamburgers? And I'm saying, well, no hamburgers. She she was it was completely stopped because I don't understand. I said, we just want the tea and we want the apple, right? She couldn't wrap her head around it. But if you think about the, you know, most of our Haggadot, when we get to um, Hillel, they'll say, Hillel sandwich, and ask your, your grandparents, what is it? Hillel sandwich? It's Hillel would put Mats and Maro together. It's even printed that way in the Seder, in the Haggadah. But of course, that's incorrect. When Hillel was alive, the temple was still standing. U ayakorech petza matza amor, right? He would you take the meat and add it to the bun and the relish, right? And he would eat the three of them together. But the ikar, the most essential part, was the meat. We're stuck with going up to McDonald's and saying, I would like two buns and a relish packet, please, right? Um, and moreover, the relish itself was was a condiment. It wasn't it wasn't in the Torah described as anything. The fact that we have in our Torah this already, we mentioned this earlier, this combination of Chag HaMatzot and Chag HaPesach, and we make them uh, contiguous one to the other. That's how we get the, 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 two, um, the two symbols of the holiday kind of stuck together, which Hillel then takes literally. But because of these odd verses, again, one in Exodus and one in Numbers, that, by the way, when you're eating it, meaning the Pesach, do so together with matzah and mirarim. And that's the only reference that the Torah gives to us. It's, it's rather, forgive me, it sounds unimportant in the Torah relative to the, 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 the main show, which is the Passover, and the secondary main show, which is the matzah. Right. So I think we, I uh, was just, just about to inadvertently make a Robbie Harris type of pun. I was going to say, I don't want to belabor um, the, the maror. Um, but uh, so I have more questions, but I think we should leave it aside because because there's, you know, a lot more stuff going on here than, than the maror. Um, so let me just ask, and I think you're probably going to get to this. Um, so it's, it's not directly on one of the texts that you shared, but um, the question also from a little while back was what exposure would the would the rabbis of this period have had to the symposium? Ah, so uh, the, the rabbis is a leadership class. Um, uh, I, I began to allude this earlier, Professor Lieberman and others have demonstrated that they knew Greek. They were quite aware of Greek customs. Um, we'll get to the very word afikomen, which is a Greek word. Um, they're very, very uh, uh, accustomed to uh, what it means to be a cosmopolitan person in the area in which they live, in the area and the time in which they live. So that, um, it, uh, again, if you think about the Passover ritual in the Torah, it's about the consumption and the the sort of together the association with this question about what is this? Ah, it's a Passover sacrifice. It's, excuse me, it's a Passover slaughtering to the Lord, right? Which, by the way, in the Bible is a good question with a good answer in the hands of the rabbinic midrash that we're not going to get to today. It's the wicked son, um, and if that's a teaser for another session, Julia. Then we can hold that over till uh, some other time. But yes, the, the wicked son is the one who asked that question in the, the Torah. Uh, be that as it may, um, they were well aware all over the Bible, uh, excuse me, all over the Talmud, you see indications of the rabbinic awareness of Greek custom. Um, uh, maybe I'll go back to the text and it'll become clear in, in, uh, in time. Yes. Okay. So let me go back to the shared screen. So we looked at Mishnah 4, and we looked at Mishnah 5, right? And each of these involves, to one degree or another, question and answering between a child who presumably doesn't know the reason that these rituals are followed, and the response of the people who are 
doing the splaining, right? Doing the explaining of why we follow this or that ritual. So note that the idea of the Mishnah asking the questions where we do have, especially via the Midrash, um, uh, highlighting these various times where it says, you shall say, or you shall ask, and excuse me, what the, should the response be? These are then collected by the, the various traditions into what becomes the, the Seder, the idea of question and answer. And the this idea permeates our Seder, but it had it had almost no precursor in in ancient, that is to say, pre-Greco-Roman antiquity. Um, in Persia, they didn't do something like this when the Persians were ruling the land of Israel or uh, you know, um, uh, the Babylonians. You know, we have no record in, in, uh, of observances. When Ezekiel talks about the Passover observance, it sounds just like Leviticus. You know, it sounds, uh, they're not uh, in Babylonia, they're not doing a Seder. They're doing a sacred meal with sacrificial meat which again is absent from our Seder. So the question and answer is the, the primary um, uh, you know, uh, indicator that they're adapting a, a, a Roman era, you know, Greco Hellenistic custom. Now they do it with wine too. You can, um, to make it blunt, there's no mitzvah to drink wine in the, in the Torah. There, there's no blessing, there's no ritual involving wine, except in so far it may appear in temple ritual. But the idea that we would have Kiddush at the beginning, let alone three or four cups, it, it, there's no indication at all in prior Jewish literature. This is the idea, remember the, the word symposium means to drink together. The rabbis are turning the sacred meal of Passover into question and answer, symbolic food, singing and ritual, and a lot of wine drinking. Now, where do they put the brakes on? Remind me, when do, when are we finished? We're finished at 2.30. 2.30. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push on a little bit. Um, the idea of question and answer permeates almost everything uh, about the Seder, even when it doesn't appear. You know, we only have the four questions in a traditional Haggadah, right? Let alone the three. But it, it underlines the idea of almost everything. It did, by the way, with Hanukkah also. The rabbis say, my Hanukkah, when they were trying to introduce a discussion to explain what Hanukkah was, again, in the Talmud, they begin with a question, right? And that was their question and answer um, we would say in, in in Hebrew or Aramaic, shakla vitaria, right? The give and take of a, of a Talmudic discourse, this is what they're bringing to the table fellowship that we call the Seder. So um, uh, uh, here's a section on, on yet another um, section of the Bible, of the Haggadah, I apologize, of the Haggadah that, Again, it has got no, absolutely no biblical precedent for, but fits in absolutely with the Roman era, you know, Hellenistic custom of the symposium. Now, pause for a minute. Earlier, I, I, I kept referring to the uh, rabbinic adoption or the adaptation of that into creating the Seder. Where do they draw the line? They draw the line right here. You see it in blue, Afi Koman. Now, if we ask any any of us in this room quickly, what's the Afi Koman? You would say, well, it's the last piece of matzah from when you break the first piece of matzah and hide it away and blah, blah, blah. And you have to have it at the end of the meal um, because that's what uh, God commands. And we'll see, it doesn't mean that at all. By the way, I'm not discounting. We're going to have a hunt for the Afi Koman in my house. Don't get me wrong. We're, this is a bit of a history lesson here, but it, it enriches our understanding of the ritual if we understand where it comes from. But here is the rule of the Mishnah. Again, it's Mishnah chapter 10, right? There we go, Mishnah chapter 10. So it's the same one that we got the other one from. And you have here the very, very clear rule. Ein maftirim achar apesach afikomen. Here's a rule. You may not conclude the Pesach with Afikomen. I can't get it to all turn blue. I don't know why. 
usually I can, but there, there's basically it. Now I have translated, I take, took this from a translation where it says revelry. We'll get to that in just a bit. But note that the word afikomen here in English transliteration, here in Hebrew transliteration, is transliterating a Greek word. I don't have to tell you that afikomen doesn't sound like a Hebrew word, but if I do, I'm telling you, it's not a Hebrew word, it's a Greek word. And what's the rule that the rabbis articulate? You may not have afikomen at your Seder. Okay. And yet every one of us will say, what do you mean? You have to have Avikomen. It's the best thing. The kids run around, they search for it, they buy, you know, they get presents and uh, right, you gotta have it. And moreover, the Avikomen is this little measly piece of matzah that that it's just like it's counterintuitive. But it is counterintuitive, especially when you consider the Mishnah, which says you're not allowed to have it at the end of the Seder. Right? Now, how do we get from you're not allowed to have it to you must have it? And how does it happen that it becomes a, a little extra piece of matzah? So I, I share a couple of texts here, one from the Mechilta and one from the Talmud Roshami. And notice that each of those things is rooted in, surprise, surprise, question and answer, right? And it combines something with what will have in our typical Seder as a separate section altogether, the four children, right? Um, again, we're not going to go into that deeply, but insofar as what Afikomen is. So Chacham Ma'omer, what does the wise child say? What are the decrees and rules that Adonai, our God, has commanded us? Right? It should be Otanu, not Etchem, as most of your, uh, your Haggadot have. Even so, you shall conclude from among the Pesach, one may not conclude the Pesach with Afikomen. So please note here, this Ein Maftiri Machara Pesach Afikomen in this Midrash that we call the Mechilta is citing the same rule that concludes the Passover rules in the Mishnah, right? So it's all circulating in, in early rabbinic antiquity, third century or so, that you're not allowed to have Afikomen at the end of the meal. Okay, now why do you teach the wise child Hilchot the Pesach Ein Maftirim? A word is dropped out, and the word is Ad. Until what you teach the wise child is all of the laws of Mishnah chapter ten, up to and including this Mishnah about about uh, Afikoman. Right, it's you're not just teaching him only about Afikomen. You're teaching him all the Mishnaic rules that you, the rabbi, are studying to understand the development of the Passover Seder from ancient sacrificial ritual to contemporary table fellowship ritual. Right, and that's rooted in Mishnah chapter ten. So again, if anything is not clear about anything I say, go pick up the Boxer book and spend. Uh, a, a nice day reading the chapter of how he explains chapter 10 of the Mishnah, because really everything comes from that. So again, the earliest rule, you must not conclude the Pesach with Afikoman, right? And it, it, just to show you that our rituals um, uh, have a sort of a rich and sometimes disturbing provenance, um, this question in a different tradition is directed about the Tipesh, You'll forgive me for a moment, the stupid child, because that's what the rabbis say. This is the, the underlying one that becomes the Tom, the simple child. But here the rabbis call him a tipesh um, because they were not always the great educators we want them to be. But that's what the, it says, what you should, you should do. And notice that the, the, the Talmud Yerushalmi directs the question that the other Midrash had directed to the wise child, he directs it to the Tipesh, which just shows you that they're, they haven't quite canonized all the traditions. At any rate, you should um, teach him about um, uh, not concluding the Pesach with Afikomen, and then it gives an explanation. Shelo yeh omed acheret that one should not get up and leave one group and enter into the gathering of another group. So what is this interpretation of the word afikomen considered? Um, what, what does it consider an explanation of afikomen? You put in like an IE. 
don't do afikoman, i.e. you're not allowed to get up and leave your house and go to another house. But whoever you have the Seder with, that's it. So why, why was this a factor? This was a factor because of um, the, uh, ancient, um, the ancient Roman practices. And the ancient Roman, we're all adults in the room, so I don't have to tell you that many of those ancient Roman practices, those fellowships and parties, ended in um, ended in uh, uh, well, uh, lots of sexual sexual uh, practices, a lot of you know fornication, um, drinking and eating to the point of you uh, needing a vomitoria. In other words, it was to excess. And this is what Professor Lieberman uh, taught in his commentary. This is my translation of his Hebrew commentary. The rabbis were familiar with Greek customs and their banquet manners. That I said banquest. I think it should be banquet. Uh, my, my bad typing. Banquet manners that when the facilities reached their peak, they would burst into other homes to force them to join in the continuing party. And they called this apikomazein, right? The Mishnah warns that one does not conclude the pastoral with afikomen or its Greek format epikomazin, and this is the correct interpretation of the Babylonian Eretz Israeli Talmud, meaning that, as Lieberman has explained it, the rabbis were concerned that you can have a, a symposium, but you can't conclude the symposium the way they would, right? Because they, it's like a, they go a bridge too far. They go drinking to drunkenness, uh, and behavior that is not um, consistent with uh, Jewish ideals of sexual expression. Um, there's no kedusha in there. The people are are, are uh, um, having orgies or whatever you want to call it. Um, and the rabbis are concerned that the format is a fine format, but not the excesses, right? So they they ask, they 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 tease out, and then they say, "You may not have this ending." You may not have an afikoman ending. But then, of course, excuse me, then, of course, you have to come to, uh, to grips with the fact that none of us ever learned this when we, you know, we all learned it's a dessert. And here's, here's basically what happened, so I won't leave you hanging altogether. Um, since the word afikoman is based in Greek, and this is a sort of an Aramaic or rabbinic Hebrew um, uh, adaptation of the word or an expression of the word, once you transfer um, the Mishnah into the Babylonian academies, into Persia, where they don't know Greek, they have no idea what the word means. I don't know what Afikoman is. And so the, the, this is, it reflects, a, it's in the Tosefta, but it, it reflects a, 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 an Eastern tradition. Um, Afikomen, for example, nuts, dates, or parched grain, meaning these are after the meal kind of delicacies, right? And the Yerushalmi preserves the um, uh, disagreement that um, types of song, well, that's that's the revelry part of it, but the other one says sweet foods, like the, the, the end, um, uh, mushrooms or stuffed doves, uh, etc. And by the time you get to the fifth or sixth century, what is Afikoman? Rav, who came from the land of Israel, said this, you're not allowed to go from group to group, but Samuel, who was born in Babylonia, says it's foods like mushrooms for me, and so and so forth. One may not conclude the Pesach with these desserts. So what had been a uh, uh, kind of a, a licentious or lewd practice has become now a kind of dessert. So it, these rabbis say, don't conclude with dessert, right? There is one more step, but I'm conscious of the time and I know that I'm supposed to pause occasionally to ask for questions. So I'll leave you hanging a little bit. How do you get from not having dessert to having a little piece of matzah? But I'll stop in case there have been questions that were asked that we need to talk about. Why don't you finish what you want to go through and then we'll... And then we'll oh yeah, is that, the that's better. Okay, yeah. I just wanted I wanted to be respectful of Thank your you. um your goals. So um, 
numbers would have here. Okay. So um, uh, Rabbi Yehuda said in Rabbi Samuel name, one may not conclude the matzah with Afikoman, right? Notice that for him, it's no longer a Pesach, it's matzah. And this reflects a shift very late in the game that somehow we're not having any kind of meat at the end, but we have a piece of matzah that um, that stands in for the Pesach, for the, the, the lamb or the goat, a piece of matzah stands in for that, and that has to be the, the last thing. One may not conclude with, uh, the, with a piece of matzah to... Again, the next paradox is you must conclude with matzah. By the time of Rashi, by the time of um, you know late uh, uh, Babylonian Gaonim, they're concluding with matzah. The question is, where do you get the matzah, right? And this is the idea of taking a, a a bit of the matzah at the beginning of the meal, when you're about to make motzi, or even earlier than that, and reserving a kind of place for that to conclude with that, meaning the first time you eat that matzah, you're eating it as bread of affliction. And the second time you eat it, you're remembering the Passover sacrifice or the, the lamb or the goat. Now, how, how do you get that? You take, you know, according to tradition, you take a piece of the matzah. How many matzot would you have at the beginning of the meal? the same as you would have for any shop you'd have two right but remember that um there are two interpretations of what this bread is in the tradition and one of this is you recall this this is the bread of affliction i'm, some, I'm sure some of you have a passover tradition that has that translated uh we hold up the matzah at the beginning this is the bread of affliction that our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. And other ones is, this is the bread of poverty, right? So lechem oni, right? Does the word mean affliction from one Hebrew word or poverty from a different Hebrew word? And as you can well expect, some get traditions that it's affliction and some get, it's a, it's a symbol of, of poverty. If it's a symbol of poverty, what is a poor person's bread like? Well, Maimonides explains this. Uh, 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 poor, uh, do I have that text here? No, I, I don't have this text. I'll just explain it to you. But he says that um, that uh, uh, bread of poverty is, uh, you know, if you if you offer a, a poor person who's hungry a shard of bread or a crumb of bread, that's that's okay. So um, he won't say, no, I need a whole loaf. He's so hungry because he's poor and hungry, he demands, and he'll accept almost anything to satisfy his hunger. So for those who preserve the one tradition of bread of poverty, they would break the matzah, tear it, because it was pliable in those days, and the other one would have two whole loaves, like you would have at the end of, at the beginning of any uh, sacred meal. And those two um Traditions get combined again by the early Middle Ages. Um, you have uh, three uh, three uh, loaves. You break a middle one. Now, if you break the middle matzah, you break it in half. That becomes the half that you reserve for the end. If you only had two, you just broke half of it. And that was lechem oni, bread of poverty. And you ate it at the end in commemoration of the Passover sacrifice. A question I like to ask is, for those of us, probably all of us have three matzot, what do you do with the other half of the middle matzah? You, most of us just sort of shove it back in and you make motzi on two and a half pieces of matzah when you get to the meal. But that is counterintuitive because there's no tradition anywhere that you take two and a half. You always take two on Passover. So the, the truth is, is this, this other half is also um, a sacred implement, it becomes its own story, which we can talk about a different time altogether. But the idea of what is the afikomen has transferred from antiquity's uh, revelry, um, uh, you know, uh, licentious behavior, don't have it at the end of your Seder, to 
it's it's sort of like a dessert. Ah, don't conclude with that dessert. Uh, no, but the matzah that you begin with, you must conclude with that because that stands for the Passover. So there's a whole evolution where this second piece of matzah that you have at the end is itself evocative of the Passover sacrifice or the Passover ritual of a lamb or a goat. And that's kind of the end of the story there for that. But again, it begins with a question. My afikoman. Again, our typical Passover Seder doesn't have that as a question, like the four questions, but itself is rooted in the question and answer of an ancient um, symposium. I'm going to stop sharing. Am I still on? Have I lost you? You you haven't lost us. I didn't know if you if I should go to questions or if you want. No, to I, I you can go to questions. Way. I didn't go to all these texts just because um, you know uh, some of us have this kind of like feeling that once you have that little matzah, when do you get like the Passover candies and can you have something else to drink and what about coffee at the end of the meal? I, I included sources that say, of course you can have that. That's not really the meal. It's not a question of fasting after that, despite that's what you might get in the, um, you know, the art scroll, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Haggadah that says, don't don't let any food pass your. Plenty of Jewish rituals say, go ahead. You want a, you want a seltzer? You want flavored seltzer? You want a piece of candy? Gegas into eight. Anyway, your questions. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for this teaching. I think many people um, have learned a lot uh, based on on the questions I've been getting. Um, so I wanted to um, I wanted to to actually just before I ask you a question, um, recommend a couple of um, works to folks who are who are interested in this, which you are if, if you're with us here. So um, I will say I'm not going to post a link to it. In in um, th there's there's an amazing and beautiful Haggadah um, called the polychrome Haggadah, which color codes uh, the layers of the Haggadah as it's developed over the centuries and millennia, really. Um, and it was it was my dad's favorite. Um, and the truth is some of the scholarship is outdated, um, but it's still an amazing thing, the polychrome Haggadah, so I'll mention it. But I'm actually posting a link to another Haggadah that's newer, um, the Schechter Haggadah, which um, has commentaries kind of um, just revealing, you know, sort of the secret history of the rituals of the Seder in the way that uh, Professor Harris has been doing um, in our session today. So if you're if you're interested in this and um, the Haggadah is half uh, these gorgeous um, manuscripts um, beautifully reproduced on the page and half um, these extensive, um, you know, full of scholarly research uh, commentaries by um, Dr. Joshua Kulp, who was my teacher when I studied at the Conservative Yeshiva. So I, if you're a glutton for this, I wanted to recommend that book. So here's the question, Professor Harris. Um, so it, we we see, um, so we have sort of this snapshot in time, and I'm synthesizing some questions from the chat. We have this snapshot in time from the time of the Mishnah, and, and you've, of course, showed us different versions of things. So even what's in the Mishnah is kind of just one version, but we have a pretty good version um, of the Seder from the time of the Mishnah that we can see is very much the, the blueprint of the Seder that we've had today, which of course has developed much, much more in the last couple thousand years. Um, is there any way to know um, how did we get from, you know, the, the very um, simple, um, or minimal, I should say, um, set of commandments in the Torah to, to what, the, I, I know you began with this, but to what the rabbis had, like sort of the sure. whole, the whole concept of, of like this elaborate multi-stage meal with these specific things, like where did, where did the idea come from of like even even to look for a model like the symposium, we're going to fit that this one commandment of the sacrifice and the matzah into this. Right. So the the short story is, um, and this is it's kind of like a, a an open secret, right? Um, is that there's precious little in the five books of Moses that we still practice anymore. 
and it's been a long time, thousands of years since we have. The, the, the means through which we observe what we observe out of the five books of Moses or the rest of the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible is Midrash. Uh, so Midrash comes from the, the verb to seek. So Midrash is that which is sought, right? Who does the seeking? The rabbis. Where do they seek it? In the Torah. But it's the process of engagement with that that, that they have kind of revivified um, uh, uh, texts that were no longer relevant in their day. And I always add Baruch Hashem, like wonderful news, because uh, we don't burn witches, right? Um, we don't stone Sabbath desecrators. There's no holy war uh, in rabbinic Judaism. And when we, we get to the things that we make into a very, very big deal, like Shabbat, right? The rabbis are very... Um, you know, very uh, clear on this. You know, Hilchot Shabbat Keharim Tulim Besear. Right? Uh, the uh, we the, the rabbinic Shabbat is arguably the most important thing that we have in Judaism today. That's preserved the unique character of of Judaism against all sorts of world pressures. But it's mentioned a couple of times in the Bible. Not such a big deal. But what? You know, we're in the middle of, you know, the book of Leviticus in our reading. The rabbis will say, you know, korbanot and tohorot are like mikra uh, harbe, halachot me'at. You know, the, the sacrifices and the purity laws, we, we discount most of that. And we've made a decision to do that by trusting the rabbinic process. I will remember going back uh, 40, maybe uh, some, maybe even 50 years to where I spent some of my first Shabbatot when I became observant, a house in Baltimore. And um, on Friday afternoon, the little boy um, came to my host, you know, and uh, recited his psukim, he recited his verses. It was from Leviticus. So um, he, he finished the father, and he had to translate them from Hebrew into English and Yiddish. And that was his, his lesson. So I sat with him afterwards. I said, Shraga, uh, you know, uh, do we do any of this anymore? And he goes, no, of course not. I said, he was five, six. I said, why don't we? And he thinks for a minute, he says, Zalozaman is there, right? It's not for this time, right? It's not Zaman is there. And I, I never forgot that, is that for him, he had already willy-nilly assimilated the whole rabbinic perspective of this was not something we do anymore. This was something to be put off for the world to come or the messianic era. But in this day and age, we don't do that. We just study it, right? On the other hand, you know, would you go to a morning minion without tefillin, right? Uh, of course you wouldn't. And you'd start Shabbos with Kiddush and candles, of course you would, right? And the, the 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 Talmud says, you know, well, what bracha do you say? Well, share it a shot of it. shel shabbat. And they say, hey, chansi vanu. Where did he command such a thing? It's not in the Torah, right? So what, what we're describing on Passover with regard to this famous dinner, this was um, one example of a whole commitment to revise or redo all of the written texts that had survived from their own antiquity into the rabbinic era. We, we call those the Tanakh, right? The, the, this anthology of ancient Israelite and Judean literature that made it into the hands of the rabbis. And it was canonized, 24 books, right? They decided what gets in and what gets out, but they functionally ignored most of it in order to create and adapt something that was transmittable from their into their own time and from their own time down to uh, the present day. And functionally, that, that process we call Midrash. All of our davening, all of our theology, all of our halakha is all rooted in Midrash. It's not rooted in, in biblical text. I'm going to put into the chat the Mishnah from Tractate Hagiga that you were quoting, which is one of my 
favorite rabbinic texts of all time, just so people have it there about the laws of Shabbat being like um, like mountains suspended on a hair. So by the I, way, Paul, when yeah. I got to the seminary, the, the those texts were just rumored. We, of course, we didn't have something on <laughs> the internet, and the the rabbis told us not to study Chagiga until we got older. I actually studied it at JTS. There you um, go. And the times uh, they are a changing. <laughs> I think um, I think part of what's so interesting to me about the Seder and part of what makes it different from um, or why I see it differently from from something like the laws of Shabbat is that at least with the laws of Shabbat, the Torah says, you know, don't do malacha, don't do work. Right. And then it's on the rabbis to figure out, well, what the heck is this work? So then they sort of do this very creative um, you know, they have they come up with this creative approach to figuring out what does malacha work if we want to translate it that way, mean. Whereas the Seder, it's like really sort of whole cloth, the idea of this this big ritual meal in place of the sacrifice. Um, so that's, I, I think that's that's part of what's so interesting about just the premise well, that's, of your session. Speaks to the, it speaks to the crisis of yeah. the destroyed temple, you know, and the Roman oppression of rabbinic Judaism in the beginning of, you know, the beginning of the common era. You know, insofar as, you know, we were in a very precarious state right? We were in a very precarious state, and it really doesn't change significantly until almost the time when the Christians took over the Roman Empire. And in that sense, Christianity needed us because they needed the counter-narrative. So we, we kind of got saved paradoxically by Christian oppression um, uh, uh, and wondering what their role was in adopting our Bible you know, and adopting our tradition and claiming the status of true Israel, right? Veris Israel, they they um they kind of saved us against uh, the Romans who had, you know, pretty ruthlessly extirpated rabbinic Judaism wherever they wherever they chose to, and it wasn't until we were fully in the kind of midrashic discourse of saying we've got to figure out how to move forward, um how we did it. And again, I, 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 when my own studies have indicated that a lot of our Seder traditions come in struggle with Christianity, who, who gets to claim what um, and how is it carried forward? Because anybody who studied Christianity know that the Passover story is central to their foundational, you know, mythic statement about, you know, the body and the blood and the role of, of Christ in the redemption of the world and, um, we needed a concomitant to that. The party's over. All right, no, I was just looking for a <laughs> final link to share with everyone because we have, um, I wanted to thank you, of course, for um, for the wonderful teaching. And we have um, a huge amount of Passover uh, learning on our website. So that is the, look, the link I was looking for. Here it is. Um, um, commentaries and videos and beautiful uh, manuscripts from the JTS library. Um, so we hope that you will um, explore more there. Um, JTSA.edu slash Torah slash Passover hyphen learning um, for anyone not looking at the chat. Um, and uh, Professor Harris, we want to thank you so much for your inaugural um, teaching in our Monday series today. It's it's a terrific. Um, you've really kind of revved up revved up the mental engines as we look ahead to Passover next week. So thank you so much. I want to welcome. I want to um, wish everyone a a happy and healthy um, and kosher holiday next week, and uh, and may it may it bring a time of more peace and stability in our world. And okay. we will look forward to seeing you all on the other side. Um, thank you again, Professor Harris. Okay, Harris. And and Julia, uh, people should know that if they scroll over to the seminary webpage to where it says the faculty, they'll they can find my picture. And if they click on the picture, they can ask a question. Uh, I always say, have their email email my email. <laughs> Um, uh, 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 they won't be the first and I'm happy to respond as best I can to their questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much.